Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost celebrates the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the Christian Church. Pentecost comes 50 days after resurrection, the resurrection of Christ. So here we are, down the road from the resurrection and celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit who birthed the church. We're going to look at that today. It's interesting that the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament, of course, was a Jewish feast, the feast of first fruits. It was a harvest festival. People would come bringing their first fruits of their crops to offer to God. And now on this Pentecost day, in the life of the Christian church, we're going to look at the coming of the Holy Spirit who energized the disciples to go out and reach a harvest of souls. That the Word of God would go out in power. That people would be changed drawn to God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit ministering through followers of Jesus. The 120 in the upper room prayed and waited 10 days after the ascension of Jesus and 10 days later came the Holy Spirit. They had waited and the Holy Spirit came and touch the lives of those people, those followers of Christ. And they, with fervor, with joy, sense the call to go out and reap the harvest of souls. Pentecost Sunday is the coming of the Holy Spirit. I don't think it's an accident that we are reopening on Pentecost Sunday. The church began then and we are beginning again. We are reopening and I'm excited about it. I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do in our midst. This is a new day. And we have a ministry that God has given us. He's called us to be the church, the church. And I like what one of the old uh, gospel singers used to say, Andre Crouch, some of you will be familiar with Andre Crouch. He was in a worship service someplace playing the piano and he was caught up in the spirit. And after a while, with the singing and the testifying and everything going on, he shouted out, We have a church! We have a church! And community, we are having church! We are having the church, but more than that, that we are being the church! We are being the church! So look with me, if you will, at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to at least begin in verses 1 through 4. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. As we do so, we're looking at the fact that the Holy Spirit came. And when the Holy Spirit came, there were three specific consequences, amazing consequences that happened as a result of the coming of the Holy Spirit to that assembled group of believers. The first consequence, there came sound. There came sound. Look at verse 1 and also verse 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. 
And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. First consequence, sound. There came sound, and that sound was something like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Now notice carefully, this is a metaphorical language here. It wasn't wind as such. This was a supernatural occurrence, a supernatural phenomenon. It sounded like a mighty rushing wind. But it was more than wind as we know it. In the Hebrew and in the Greek, as well as in the Latin languages, the words wind, spirit, breath, are interchangeable. They're the same. The word is one word. It's the same word. Knowing that, look with me back in Genesis chapter 2, if you will. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. You see here, when the Lord God formed man, he formed Adam out of the dust. And in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, look at what we read there. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. God breathed into Adam's nostrils his breath. It's called the breath of life. You could say he breathed into the nostrils of Adam the wind. The wind of life. So when we come back to Acts chapter 2 and we find a sound like that of a mighty rushing wind, we could say like a mighty rushing breath. It was the very breath of God that filled that room. They couldn't miss it. And that breath of God, that sound as if it was a mighty rushing wind, was life-giving, just as Adam had been given life by God. Here was life on that day of Pentecost, spiritual life. But also there is a second consequence. We see it in verse 3 in the text here in Acts chapter 2. There came sight, sight. Look with me at verse 3. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Divided tongues of fire, as, as fire. Again, it's supernatural here. It's something like fire. Rested on the heads of those believers. And they sensed the presence of the Lord. You see, fire points to the presence of the Lord in His holiness and purity. Moses in Exodus chapter 3 heard the voice of God inviting him to himself, but yet it was something at first at a distance because God said to Moses, as that bush was on fire but not consumed. It was a fiery bush and God said, Moses, do not come near me, for the ground upon which you are standing is holy ground. The presence of God, you see, means holy, means pure, means righteous, 
means a God who does not wink at sin, who judges sin. And here in the, the book of Acts, as this place is filled with the presence of God in the form of these divided tongues of fire, light tongues of fire, God was there. He was there. So we have, we have sound, we have sight. The tongues of fire appeared, but there is a third consequence when the Spirit came. Look with me at verse 4 in the text. There came speech. There came speech. Look with me. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak out in other tongues, in other languages, no languages. And it was the Spirit that gave them utterance. These languages were understood. These were not mysterious, mystical languages. These were all languages that were understood. And the people who were there for Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, Pentecost heard, heard them speaking and heard them speaking languages that they could understand. Think of it. As we read in verse 5, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Amazing miracle. What were they speaking? Well, we have some insight if you drop down to verse 11 in Acts 2, the last part of it. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. We'll get back to that in just a moment. So then, here, here we have it in terms of the coming of the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost, He came. There was sound like a mighty rushing wind, a breath, meaning life, spiritual life. He came bringing a sight. The sight was tongues as of fire, something like fire there in that place, indicating the presence of God. And then he came giving the believers new languages. Languages to praise God. So you look at this again, these three consequences of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And what do you have? You have the followers of Jesus gathered with a lot of other people around. And there was an emphasis upon spiritual life spiritual life. There was an emphasis upon the presence of God there. You couldn't miss it. And there was an emphasis upon speech, communication of the word of God to others. That's Pentecost. And what happened on Pentecost and the birth of the church. But now you're asking the preacher a question. So what? So what? Nice story. Kind of fun to read. We get kind of excited about miracles. But so what? What does it mean to my life? What does it mean to my church? 
So we want to try to answer that question, so what? So what? This coming of the Holy Spirit makes all the difference in the world. I think, especially in some circles, Christian circles, the Holy Spirit is the forgotten deity. We want to worship God our Father. We worship the Son, Jesus. And we never want to neglect those things. But we have to remember the third person in this Trinity, this triune God, is the Holy Spirit. He is a person. He, not an it, not an it. He, he, he is a person. And he is in the world today. And he is in the life of every follower of Jesus, every believer. If you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people at different times. But when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, it meant that the Holy Spirit would now be in people. In people. And people saved who had the Holy Spirit can be filled many times. Filled for extraordinary ministries. For facing difficult tasks. Filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're saved, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. You identify with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live within you. When you're filled, you're filled for many different things and there are repeated fillings. Paul said, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Live a Spirit-filled people. Sadly, there are many Christians who are content to simply live lives where they're believing in Jesus. They know they're going to heaven, but they aren't at all interested, interested in being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, to meet the challenges of ministry and touching people's lives. You see, when, you, when you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit. But when you're filled, the Holy Spirit gets more of you. You're yielded. You're surrendered to the life of the Spirit within you. Surrendered. Surrender to God. And if you're like me, I resist surrendering to God. And when I do that... I can quench the Holy Spirit who is seeking to fill me and use me in some way. And so what does it mean today? Well, let's, let's come at it this way. Looking at the early church there, what happened with the sound, the sight, and the speech, we'd have to say, first of all, that a Spirit-filled church, and that's what we want to be, isn't it? That's what you want. That's what I want. We want to be a spirit-filled church. Not just any old traditional Christian church with a rich heritage. We're thankful for that. But we want to be living in the now, walking with the Spirit, in step with the Holy Spirit, filled to overflowing, communicating the love of God in Jesus Christ. So, if we must be a Spirit-filled church, that means we must be a church under the influence, under the influence. I use that phrase because it's, it's pointed to in Acts chapter 2, when the disciples were caught up in the Spirit, speaking the other languages, they were energized. Uh, they were on fire. On fire. And now notice there were some 
people that didn't appreciate that. You see, when the Holy Spirit gets hold of you, you can just depend on it. There's going to be some wet blankets who want to put the fire out. And in Acts chapter 2, look with me at verse 14 and 15. Peter preaches his first sermon on the day of Pentecost. This has all been happening, and now he preaches his first sermon. And he does so, he begins, his introduction relates to the verse right before his message. In verse 12, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? This, this was the people that were around. But others mocking said, they, that is, these followers of Christ, are filled with new wine. What were they saying? These people are drunk. They're intoxicated. And I'll agree they were intoxicated. But they were intoxicated with the Holy Spirit of God. And notice what Peter says. As he begins his, his message there. But Peter standing with the eleven lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Notice verse 15 now. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. These people are not drunk. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, church. Would that we would truly be a church under the influence, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means enjoying Jesus. It means having a desire to reach others for Christ. It means taking a stand when others aren't. It means being an energized body. Fervent for the Lord. A church under the influence. And that also means a church declaring the glory of God. The praises of God. That's what happened there. Verse 11, I noted it earlier. What were these languages all about that the people were hearing? Well, Verse 11 again, we hear them telling in our own language the mighty works of God. That's what they were saying. They were declaring the glory of God. They were praising the Lord. That's what they were saying. At this point, it wasn't come to Jesus. That would be later in Peter's sermon. They're simply praising God and the glorious works and wonders of God. Psalm 40 and verse 5. Notice what we read there. The psalmist says concerning God, You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. Notice there, wondrous deeds and thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Here is a psalmist whose heart is filled with the praises of God. He is declaring the glory of God, and he can't find, he can't find it within himself to say all he wants to say. It goes beyond words. And this is what early church was doing on Pentecost after the sound and the sight and the speech came the declaration of the mighty works of God great praise would that we could be a church under the influence 
and also a church filled with praise every time we gather together. Vocal praise, loud praise. Is this a time to be done with weak, insipid singing? Is this a time to be renewed in that aspect? That when I get with the body, when I get in the fellowship, I don't care who's next to me. If Joe Jones doesn't like it on one side, and if uh, Sam Johnson on the other side doesn't like it, I'm still going to praise God with all I've got. I'm done with being a people pleaser. I'm going to be a God pleaser. And I'm going to enter into praise and worship as never before. They declared the praise of God. This Pentecostal church also was anchored, anchored on, on the word of God. It's apparent. You look there in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and following. Peter says, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. He begins his sermon going back to the Old Testament scriptures. That's what he had. He brings the people to the word of God. He talks about the prophecy of Joel. Peter's sermon here, and as you go through it, it's filled with the word of God. Filled with the word of God. A spirit-filled church is one anchored on the word of God. Anchored. And not only anchored, not only so that we can say, well, yes, we believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. We certainly believe that. I'm saying to you, it's one thing to believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, and we do, but it's another thing to take this Bible and get on fire for Jesus. Get on fire for the Lord. Just because you and I have a doctrine doesn't mean we're, we're living in the energy of the Holy Spirit. We can be evangelical and yet spiritually dead. Anchored on the Word of God no matter what. So that means we want to hear the Word of God. We want to study the Word of God. We want to share the Word of God. And we want the Holy Spirit to help us apply the teachings of the Word to our own lives. We don't want to be complacent church people. A Spirit-filled church is combustible, not complacent, combustible. There's a fire, there's a fire, and it's erupting. Fire of God. Some years ago I was preaching in a service, and as I was preaching about halfway through the message, a little boy, third grade boy, came walking up the center aisle and stood right in front of me. He looked at me and he asked me a question. I stopped speaking. He asked, do you, do you know where my Bible is? Do you know where my Bible is? Now, that was a Sunday where earlier in Sunday school, the third grade had been given their own Bibles. He'd been given a Bible, but he'd already lost it. But it was in church someplace. And I don't know how he happened to be in church at that point and coming up, but he had no hesitancy. He came right up, wanted to ask the guy standing up front who was talking all the time, must have some information for him. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I really don't know where your Bible is, but I know there are some people out here that can help you find it. And there were some people, a couple people got up 
in the back and went with him to find his Bible. Do you know where my Bible is? Do you know where your Bible is? On that coffee table, nice display, and guests come. Sort of like the Sears Roebuck catalog of days gone by. Bible on a shelf in the den, gathering dust. Do you know where your Bible is? It's so good to see so many of you have your Bibles. Bring your Bibles. Wonderful. Praise God for that. Do you know where your Bible is? And do you know what God is saying to you in your Bible? Then will you note with me this, this spirit-filled church was a church that loved Jesus. A church that every day fell more in love with Jesus. Jesus is all over Peter's first sermon there in Acts 2. And Peter talks about the coming of Christ, his crucifixion for the people's sins. And he talks about the resurrection. And then Peter says toward the conclusion of his, of his uh, message, down about verse 36 of Acts 2, then let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. By the way, you notice Peter's boldness here? This is Peter who denied the Lord three times. This is Peter who ran the, the other way when he saw the authorities coming. This is Peter who now says to people, your sins, you crucified the Prince of Life. It was you. Here's Peter. He's filled with boldness right now. And this is another mark of spirit-filled church. We have a boldness, a boldness to, to stand, a loving boldness, where I am not ashamed, you are not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also the Greek. I am not ashamed. Are you ashamed of Jesus? I trust not. I trust not. Are you ashamed of Jesus out there? Out there tomorrow, next week? Peter had a boldness. A boldness. Someone makes fun of you, ridicules you, speaks in such a way that your feelings are hurt, so what? So what? Coaches hurt the feelings of their players all the time, but the players still play. We don't care what people do to us, do we? Really? Not ashamed. Peter was bold. How did he become bold? Filled with the Holy Spirit. That he couldn't keep from talking. He couldn't keep from preaching. He couldn't keep from telling it like it is. And that boldness is always a loving, a loving boldness, isn't it? Not obnoxious, but forthright with a concern for souls of people. I am not ashamed. This is the testimony of the Spirit-filled church. And notice, as it continues there, in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it goes on. But we learn that on that day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were saved. And that was just the beginning. Loved ones, we cannot be satisfied with no growth in the church. We cannot be satisfied with transfer growth, where people transfer in from other churches. We can't be satisfied with that. We're thankful for when people come, but we can't be satisfied if year after year goes by and no one is born again. No one comes into the fellowship. A saved man, a saved woman, can we ever be satisfied with simply business as usual? The Spirit-filled church is never that way. Not satisfied with going on the same way and never reaching anybody. I'm thankful for the ones that have been reached and for you who are reaching out. More power to you. But church, in the spirit of Pentecost, looking at the power of the Holy Spirit, all of this in Acts chapter 2 is directed toward that, toward that proclamation of this simple truth. You and I are called to be a spirit-filled people. A spirit-filled church. Not doing things because it's always been done that way before. But wanting God's new life. God's new purpose. God's new joy for us. And so here we have it. Pentecost means being a church under the influence of God, His Word, His life, His presence, His power. It means being a Spirit-filled church that is praising, declaring the glory of God every, every time the church meets. And it means being a church Anchored on the word of God, no matter what. Here, like Martin Luther, here I stand, I can do no other. Here I stand. Culture, liberalism, the enemy himself, here I stand on the word of God, thus says the Lord. And then, we're loving Jesus, aren't we? We're loving Jesus. Just loving Jesus. In some ways, the church is no more complicated than that. Just loving Jesus, who first loved us, gave his life at the cross, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Being saved is not a matter of living by rules and regulations. Going to a particular church, a church doesn't save anyone, it's Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross for us. We love him because he first loved us. Pentecost. Coming alive. Coming alive. In the word, in worship, in outreach, not being satisfied unless we see people coming into the kingdom. Give me souls or I die, said the preacher. Come with me back to 1983 in there. At that time was a company called Apple. You're familiar with Apple. Just starting out in those days, Steve Jobs needed someone to help him in that work, and he had 
he had found a man that he wanted on the Apple team. The man's name was John Scully. John Scully was the president of Pepsi-Cola. That was the only job he'd ever had. He was committed to that job with Pepsi. But Steve Jobs asked him many times, come with me to Apple. I need you with me. And John Scully said no more than once. But finally, Steve Jobs asked him a question. And it was this question that changed things for John Scully to where he left Pepsi and joined Apple. Do you know what that question was? Jobs asked him, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? The Holy Spirit is asking you and me, do I want to settle for things that aren't eternal, that are passing, fleeting? Or am I willing to come with the Holy Spirit and change the world? That's the challenge to the Spirit-filled church. Let's pray. Lord God, we all fall short of your standard, and we confess that too often we are satisfied with the ho-hum of our spiritual lives and the ho-hum nature of the church. We don't want that anymore, Lord. This is a a new beginning as we reopen today. Lord God, help us that we might have a, a spontaneous, a spontaneous living out of your life, that the Holy Spirit would live freely in us and accomplish his purposes. Fill us, Lord, again and again overflowing, that we might live for Jesus and live in the victory that he has provided. For we ask it in Christ's name, amen. This is a message to believers, to followers of Christ, to the church. There may be someone hearing this message, here or online, you're not saved, or you'd like to have assurance of salvation, you're seeking. Let me say to you, the Holy Spirit that we've been talking about today is speaking to your heart right now. He wants you to know that you're a sinner. You cannot save yourself. He wants you to know that you are to repent of your sins, turn from them and forsake them. And then also to receive Jesus Christ into your life by faith, trusting that what God did at the cross through Jesus was for you. He took all your sins there at the cross he was crucified for all your sins, and as you trust in Jesus, you bear them no more. You're forgiven and you're free. Praise God. That is the essence, the bedrock confession of the church. We're going to sing our closing song today. We're going to depart from what uh, we had on the screen or in the bulletin. Uh, someone requested, and I was very glad to second that request. Uh, it, it, no problem at all. Victory in Jesus. Can we stand? Can we sing it? We'll do just the first stanza. Stay with the first stanza. Let's sing it. <laughs> 